Hi everyone, my name is Katherine Tao and I'm the host of the Data Standard Audio Experience. And today we have Justin Conley, a lead data scientist at 8451. And today we're going to be speaking about causal inference. So welcome to the show, Justin. I'm excited to speak with you and just learn more about your experiences. Awesome, thank you, Kat. Really glad to be here. Yeah, so let's just get started. Can you please tell the audience more about your background and maybe what led you to 8451? Uh, yeah, so my name is Justin Conley. As you said, uh, I'm a lead data scientist at 8451, uh, which is basically just the uh, consumer analytics branch of the Kroger company. So uh, that also includes all the um, brands that come under Kroger as well. So uh, like Ralph's, Food for Less, QFC, a uh, bunch of different brands. But as a data scientist too, uh, and not an official spokesperson, I'll just throw in that caveat too, that uh, all the views are obviously my own and, and not necessarily representative of the company. I don't think there's any problems here, but just wanted to, to get that groundwork done. As far as my background, I didn't expect to get into data science at all. So my background was in philosophy and religion, at least on the surface, very different from data science. But in looking for jobs, it was a little bit difficult with that kind of degree, especially if you're not looking to move anywhere in the country. And again, it's just very limited. And so I ended up uh, getting what I thought would be a temporary job at an insurance company. I was teaching part-time classes online for diversity and world cultures uh, at the college level. But again, it was a very uh, part-time role. Definitely wasn't enough to actually live on and, and support a family and have a career. So when I started at the insurance company, I thought maybe within a year or two, I'd find something related in my field. But a few months in, I had started to automate some of the processes that I was handed. So they gave me some Excel processes. I really hate doing the same thing over and over again. And so I started to record macros and then opened up uh, VBA and saw, oh, wow, I can control computers and do things. So um, that's what really opened the door for me uh, into data science. That was kind of the first step. As I started to automate processes, more and more complex types of processes came at me. So, you know, being able to automate, you know, classification or something like that for, for some programs into the past before they were classified and different forecasting or um, various techniques that required a little bit more of the science side kept coming up. And so, uh, just mostly through YouTube channels, you know, reading some papers here or there online, uh, I was able to learn more of that science side and, and grow as an analyst. Uh, so after a few years of doing that at the insurance company, uh, I ended up moving on just because there was nowhere to go. They had created that position for me. So it's kind of a quick note on that, I guess. About four months into the job, I had automated out this fax and email that cut out roughly a third of the phone calls for the call center. So that was a few thousand calls a week. So that's kind of the point where they said, okay, just do this full time. Like this is worthwhile. Um, and so because they had created a position, there was also nowhere to really go from there, especially as a data scientist, where I was wanting to continue to grow as a career. And so um, I had a friend working at 8451. We had talked a lot and it sounded like a really good opportunity. So um, I applied and, and came on board about five and a half years ago. Awesome. It's great to hear about your journey too. It's so um, different coming from um, a religious major and then coming into kind of the tech field. So that's awesome. Uh, so now I just wanted to dive deeper into the, the main topic today, which is causal inference. And so can you tell the audience more about what this is and how it's typically used within an industry setting? So the basic idea of causal inference is when we're looking for patterns in the data that we can infer some sort of causal relationship. Uh, that comes up for a few different reasons. One of the biggest ones, obviously, is just trying to measure the effects of something. So there's a lot of literature online about using this for medical cases. So setting up a good treat control test scenario and trying to understand what are the effects of this treatment on some uh, medical outcome. So there's a lot of really good information on that, but that's also a really simple problem. You know, you have a binary outcome typically, like did they get better or not? And then a uh, your input is pretty binary as well. Uh, and most of the time you can set up a really good test. Uh, where it comes into the industry, I'd say a lot more is, uh, such as in retail, trying to measure ROI. Anytime you're measuring ROI, you're talking about causal inference because you're ultimately trying to figure out the difference between what did happen and what would have happened if you didn't do something. Uh, so anytime you're doing that, you're trying to produce that counterfactual or just counter to what actually happened. You're trying to produce this artificial world. Being able to do that accurately is a major challenge. Uh, it also comes up if you're wanting your models or AI to be more generalized. So if you want to be able to take it from one kind of small sample of test data that you have or training data, and you want to be able to expand it into other areas, it's going to do that a lot better if you're able to pick up on causal effects and not just patterns that in that specific circumstance happen to tell you a lot about what the predicted outcome should be. 
the first time that I uh, came up with this was basically or ran into this was uh, it was kind of one of those boil the ocean sort of uh, scenarios where uh, the company was trying to understand and I can't go into a ton of detail, but I can give a pretty good general overview. The company wanted to be able to understand what is the effect of all these different things on customers and their loyalty. So things like uh, digital coupons and we have physical personalized coupons. You know, they were investing in uh, being able to do delivery and uh, pickup options and then price promotion and obviously a ton of others. So there's all these things that are happening at once and getting some sort of ROI or even just understand like what customers value, what, uh, what influences the most is a pretty big challenge. And so I approached it thinking that this was essentially going to be just another prediction problem. And it was, uh, I found out much more than that. So even though those, uh, again, test situations are really good and it's awesome when you're able to do that. And certain companies, especially online, where you can kind of randomize uh, digital customers a lot easier than randomizing people in a physical store. Even though that comes up quite a bit, I would say a lot of the opportunity and the biggest challenge is the real world and trying to understand these effects in the real world. That's awesome insight. And so I wanted to talk more about some challenges that you've seen with causal inference. What are some of the biggest issues or problems that you've seen or you've faced through using causal inference? I would say there are both technical challenges as well as ways of working challenges. The the technical challenge kind of starts with the fact that most people think that they're working on a prediction problem when they're actually working on a causal inference problem. To explain that maybe a little bit more, if you're predicting weather or something like that, like you obviously have no real control over the weather. You're not trying to figure out what levers to pull to change the future weather. Uh, you're mostly just trying to react to the future. And so that's a pretty classic prediction problem. You're not trying to figure out what would have happened in this case or that case. And so again, it's just a, a normal prediction problem. Uh, whenever you're trying to, again, create that counterfactual, you're trying to understand what would have happened if we did not run this promotion, for example, you don't have that ground truth to compare to. So in prediction problems, you're able to understand your accuracy. It's uh, what did you expect to happen and then what actually happened. In causal inference, you're trying to accurately predict what would have happened in some alternative world and then compare that to what did happen. And so you don't have that alternative world, right? You don't have that world where you didn't run this promotion or where this or that didn't happen. And so uh, because of that, you have no ground truth. One of the other kind of simplified explanations that I've tried to use that's helped some business leaders, um, at least our business leaders, was that in prediction problems, you will have you know multiple things, all of your predictor variables, uh, trying to predict one thing or inform one thing. With causal inference, it's basically trying to run that in reverse, where you're using one outcome or sales, uh, and you're trying to understand the influence of all of these other things. Uh, just on the information you have for that one and the relationships between them. And so it's a much more challenging problem. Uh, it's a, uh, a difficult problem if you want to have any sort of confidence in your results, which obviously kind of goes into that ways of working part that I mentioned. So we struggled a lot in our ways of working because the business was used to working on you know, reporting and prediction problems and things where you have a pretty straightforward outcome. You know if you succeeded or not, by how much, uh, all that kind of stuff. With causal inference, you quickly realize that because we don't have that ground truth, there are some different refutation methods and ways to try to understand, at least rule out some uh, things that could affect accuracy. So I mentioned some of those actually in a, a recent uh, YouTube uh, video that I had posted to my channel. But even though you have that, at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't believe the results, like there's no ground to stand on to say, no, we know it's accurate and by this much. Uh, and so obviously that poses a lot of problems. So anybody that can, that's approaching a problem like this, it would be really good if they could handle a lot of those things up front with the business. So be able to handle, you know, first of all, just let them know, like, here's the kind of problem we're working on. Here is some of the tests that we'll have for success, but it's going to be different than maybe some other problems you've worked on in the past. And then also be able to kind of head off, I would say the response by saying, you know, if it ends up saying this or that, how are we going to respond? Like, what is basically what does the outcome look like uh, in these different scenarios? So, I know that's not typically kind of the technical side, right? That data scientists are thinking through <laughs> for the most part, but because uh, this one I would say really stretches. And that's why I'd said that I think it's probably the most challenging part of data science because uh, there's not a great technical solution uh, to the problem. And so, uh, you really have to think through kind of just rationally, philosophically, um, and even kind of with that. Um, 
you know, business goal in mind as to whether or not it's worthwhile, what it's going to look like, how you succeed uh, and all of that. So, yeah, I guess that's about it. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's really important just to have that team collaboration aspect as well and just really know the end overall end goal for the business goal to know what kind of technical analysis you need to be extracting from your data or um, just any like your software, anything that you're doing like that, you need to know the end goal. You don't want to overcomplicate things if it's a simpler problem than it is. And that's mm -hmm. something that I hear from a lot of uh, different data scientists. So great insight. And so now I just wanted to get your thoughts about just data science in general. A lot of people are saying it's just a buzzword. Other people are saying it's going to really innovate the tech world in the future. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a really good question. We're definitely in the explosion of data science, of course, and I don't see it coming to an end anytime soon. I, th I think it's about as likely to end as, um, you know, the internet being a buzzword 20 years ago or something. We're definitely at a point where it's starting to change a lot. So, you know, we're starting to see a lot more specialization occur, I would say. So, you know, some people are starting to focus more on the engineering side of data science, uh, where they're just understanding all the different systems, especially cloud-based systems and how to move data around and productionize models efficiently and all that kind of stuff. There's so much information and knowledge growing there that people are starting to kind of be forced to specialize in that if they're going to go that route. Uh, others are kind of specializing more on the insight side, a little bit more of that business lead type side where they're trying to understand the business problems well enough to basically understand how can data help us here? How can data give us a solution? And then uh, obviously automation and some of the stuff that I did early on, industries are still very ripe for that. Uh, I think RPA, uh, robotic process automation is going to continue to explode. I see no shortage of, you know, one of my good friends actually works uh, doing that at uh, another insurance company. And there is just, I mean, almost unlimited processes that are still able to be automated. So that entire, you know, concern that people have about the kind of white collar automation thing that we're going to be hitting over the next couple of decades, it's definitely, I would say, real, uh, especially for processes that are very easy to automate. And there are quite a few. So data scientists will be the ones who do that. And so I think the future is definitely bright for for data scientists, but uh, it's also not going to be a, a general path that I think we continue to call data science. I guess one of the ways that I would also think about it is that the biggest gap that I'm seeing right now is for somebody who understands data science well enough to be able to lead as a business leader. And so kind of one of the ways that I think about it is it's almost like you have people who were really good at managing construction projects uh, when it was basically just people with hand tools building small homes. And now that we have data science kind of coming along and creating things like bulldozers and backhoes and things like that, there's not a lot of great people who are able to transfer that knowledge into this new space and leverage those new and powerful tools really well. And so uh, I see a really big opportunity and gap there right now. And that gap, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to be closing a lot. Uh, it, it's something I started to notice a lot a few years ago, and I haven't seen a ton of progress in, in closing it. It seems like it's because of that pool that I talked about with specialization that data scientists just keep getting kind of further embedded down into these specialties so that you're not leaving a lot of people kind of at that top who have a good understanding of different techniques and methodologies and approaches and challenges so that they can take a business problem and say, here's how we can use data science to, to create a solution. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's about it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that data science is really going to be innovating just the future of the tech world. And th like you said, there is, it doesn't look like there is an end in sight. Yeah. And I agree with you. I think the only, if there is an issue in the future, it would be the talent gap. I've heard from a lot of different companies and just data scientists that I've talked to. A lot of them need data scientists, but the kind of like the, the background knowledge or experiences that a person may have on paper isn't what companies really need. Like you said, you kind of need yeah. to know a little bit of everything. You can't just be completely specialized in one thing. You need to know the business side, you need to know the tech side and everything in between. So yeah, great insight on that. Yeah. So thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciated your time. We at The Data Standard, we're trying to build a community of just data thought leaders and data enthusiasts in order for everybody to have a platform where they can speak to each other during this just remote world that we're in. What, what is something that we can do for you? I mean, things like this are, are great to me, like being able to just see different data scientists come on from uh, different industries, different areas, and, and just kind of share 
things that they're thinking about, things that they're working through. I think that helps us to become, I mean, you kind of mentioned it, right? Needing to have a good knowledge across the board, even if you are specializing. So yeah, I think that it makes us just better as a data science community, more effective. I think we can build a lot better and, and cooler things uh, as we hear from each other, get ideas and yeah, just learn and grow together. Yeah, absolutely. And where can our community find you online? I am on LinkedIn backslash Justin Co, uh, Justin Co. Uh, as well as on YouTube. I have a, a channel that I started a couple months ago, a few months ago now, um, called Philosophy of Data Science. There's a lot of really good technical information out there, but um, I'm trying to move into some of the just like philosophical ideas around data science, uh, whether it's algorithm fairness or or some of the data science news and things that come up, things that people don't typically think about, but um, that also might be helpful. Absolutely. And so for more information on the data standard, you can find us at www.datastandard.io. And this episode is sponsored by Pandio. They're innovating their tech space with an Apache Pulsar messaging system. Learn more about their work at pandio.com. And thank you so much, Justin, for joining us. It was just so great speaking with you and we hope to see you soon. You as well. Thanks, Kat.